And if you remember over the last couple of weeks, we see that the sower, a farmer, was walking through a field. Jesus was teaching this, uh, this parable and broadcasting seed. Jesus was the sower. You and I are sowers when we communicate the word of God. The seed is the word of God. The soil is the heart. We know from last week that some of the seed fell on rocky ground or, or beaten down paths and uh, birds came and stole it away. And we talked last week about how that was Satan himself or the demons who come and steal the word. Well, this week we're going to be talking about the next little section in this parable, the parable of the sower. And this little section here is really important because it talks about people who appear to have genuine faith, who look like they've heard the message of the gospel, that they've received it, they've got excited about it. They come to church for a period of time. They buy a Bible, they read it, they talk to everybody about Jesus, and then something in life happens and their faith is challenged and they walk away. And Jesus indicates that sometimes they never come back. And so today we're gonna see the rocks in life, the limestone rock beds in life, the trials, the times of testing of our faith, and our responses to these times of testing. Because testing or trials reveal the strength of our faith. They reveal to us who we really trust. And we all go through them. And so if you and I, we look together at the parable of the sower, we see Jesus talking about this excerpt that we're gonna to cover today. And his interpretation is really short. And we're gonna start off looking at 1 John, talking about what real faith, faith that endures, looks like. And so I hope that you'll bear with me here for the next 10 minutes or so. And we're gonna develop a quick doctrine or understanding of what real healthy faith looks like from 1 John, the kind of faith that endures. And so let's look together at Jesus' words here. A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places. That's where we are today, where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. So what does real faith look like? What does true faith that endures look like? Let's look at this from 1 John. 1 John teaches us that true faith is more than just words. And now you may not really be tracking with me at this point and sort of resonating with what I'm saying, but let me help explain this for a second. Have you ever known somebody that's just all talk? They just talk a Christian talk and, and can bless you and, and give you all sorts of things you should do and write prescriptions straight from scripture and maybe even has memorized a few scripture verses and can, can kind of recite them sometimes in the most inconvenient or insensitive times who seems to want to act like they're super spiritual. But when it really comes down to it, there's just not much there that Maybe they signed a card at a young age in some church somewhere and said they prayed to receive Jesus and maybe, you know, kind of exists around the Christian community, but there's just not much substance. Well, First John says that true faith is more than just words, that true faith is also obedient actions, that there's an obedience that follows. And when we hit times of testing in our lives, sometimes we have to make hard choices like, am I going to forgive when somebody wrongs me? Am I gonna love when people in my life are unlovable? Am I gonna give when it seems to make more sense in the time I'm going through in my life to hoard or to stockpile? Am I gonna serve even though I'm busy and have other things that I should be doing? In 1 John, we learn that true faith goes beyond just words, that it actually is backed up and followed with actions and actions of obedience. And so he gets a little deeper as we develop this truth and we see that, that true faith is demonstrated not just by the right words and an obedience to God, but not loving the world. True faith is demonstrated by your heart not being drawn toward the things of this world. Now, I see already that we have some difficulty as we process these three things that we're discussing. Because we live in a world that has a competition for our heart, for our attention. We are pulled away from the things of God, that we have a desire in us, our sinful nature, that desires things that, that God really has very little interest in us being involved in. 
And so when you begin to look at your faith and determine whether or not your faith is true and enduring, you ask yourself the question, what do I think about? Where does my mind go when the RPMs of life settle down enough for me to have some discretionary thoughts? How do I spend my time? Where is my money being invested? And if it looks like, if you look at these three things in your life and sort of analyze who you are and where you are with these three things, you can sort of get a determination of the depth of your faith and maybe if there are actions that, that are being backed up by the words. Parenting's a good indication of this. It's so hard for us to, to be able to back up our words with actions. And I'm certainly no expert on parenting. Just because I've done it doesn't make you an expert. My dad always said that you don't know how good of a parent you are until your kids turn 40. And then I turned 40 and he said, you don't know until they turn 50. And now that I turned 50, he's working on 60. Um, he keeps giving me a little grace period. Dad's probably watching right now and mom, happy Mother's Day. Um, but uh, I, I think, and I've never had girls. I have a granddaughter and uh, I'm excited about being a grandparent to her. But with boys especially, I think boys, they uh, are trying to learn about whether their parents' faith is real. And I think what the way they relate to us is I, I think they listen to the moms and what moms say, but I think they watch what their dads do. And they wanna see if there's substance that, that, that's there, if there's a genuineness about the faith, if there's something worth pursuing, because after all, somebody who says something's important but never really backs it up with, with a life, with actions, well, it's empty and sometimes kids, they can see it. And we as parents have this huge responsibility, not just to say it, but to model it. And they know, they know what we do with our thoughts. They know what preoccupies us, whether we're consumed with worry, whether we're consumed with materialism, whether we're consumed with planning things of this world, whether we're spending our money on the Lord and ministry, whether we are spending our time. Well, we see three things. The first thing, True faith is more than just words. The second thing, true faith is backed up by something action-oriented, obedience. The true faith really doesn't involve a love for the sin and the things in this world. That we're, in fact, supposed to reject sin and the things in us that are displeasing to God, the thoughts, actions, and attitudes that we're willing to pray the prayer of King David where David says, I confess the things in me, God, that I know you don't want there the thoughts, actions, and attitudes that are displeasing. But reveal to me these things, just bear with me here. Reveal to me these things that are lurking within me that I don't even know are there that are keeping my faith from being genuine. And when these things are being revealed to us, then in fact, we confess, we make these things right. So it's not just that we don't have a pull toward the world, but that we've turned our back on sin, that there's no more tolerance in our own lives for the things that we know we carry around with us that destroy and undermine our faith, that we're being real, that we're willing to stand up against the schemes of the evil one and the current of this world. Well, there's another one, this last one, and this last one's really important. And as we read through 1 John, you see evidences of real and genuine enduring faith. And we wanted to start, of course, with a positive example because Jesus presents a choice in this parable and, and says that some are, in fact, are gonna hit difficulties in life, trials. They're gonna hit times of testing and they're gonna turn away and their roots are gonna wither and the plant is gonna die. Or perhaps they endure and they grow and develop depth. Well, this is the final thing we're gonna look at in 1 John, that true faith is demonstrated by loving each other. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love each other remains in death. The way that you and I treat each other. I wanna encourage you on Wednesday evening to be here in this room at 6.30 where Pastor Dan will be teaching about how it is we relate to each other in the body of Christ, how we choose to love each other with agape love, not the love of convenience, not the love of emotion, but the enduring love that comes from a genuine faith. Because the Bible tells us that the world around us sees and judges whether Jesus is real 
based on the way the world sees you and I treat each other, which means what we say and what we do is really important. How we resolve conflict, how we apply 1 Corinthians 13 to our lives. And don't simply just read it at the beginning of a marriage ceremony. So Jesus said, there are some people who hear the message and receive it with joy in Luke chapter eight. And upon hearing the message, run into difficulties in life, um, trials, things that happen that cause them to abandon faith and go a different route. And Jesus really presents a diverging trail, a path that you have to choose whether we go right or left. And, and oftentimes that trail diverges at the point of a trial or a difficulty in life. And maybe there's some of you facing these difficulties right now. Maybe you have just come through one. Perhaps if you haven't just come through one and you're not facing one, you're going into one, but we know that trials and times of testing will happen. We're gonna look in just a minute at James and how James tells us that you and I cannot be like the ones Jesus warned about in this parable, but we can have enduring faith. My boys, when they were growing up, liked to uh, work on stuff. And I'm not a mechanic. Um, Pastor Dan is uh, the mechanic on staff. Uh, Jared's a pretty good mechanic, um, but uh, I, I can't fix anything. I like to try. Um, I, I like to, you know, if something breaks, I'll go and I got my tools and, you know, I'll, I'll try to fix it. And usually I have to have somebody like Dan or Jared come help me with what I've tried to repair. But um, I would always teach the boys, let them use my tools, um, you know, just have them, you know, kind of try to get handy and, and know how to do stuff. And, and so I realized early on that if I was gonna share my stuff with them, that they weren't gonna be super careful with it, that kids lose things and break things. And if I bought expensive things, that I would be angry at them all the time. And so I would go to, to Sam's every year and buy the cheapest set of Husky tools that I could find all of them in this plastic little suitcase, you know, with all the little spots where they pop in, um, chromium steel or whatever they are, like a 98 bucks for 244 pieces. And every year in January, I would start with a brand new tool set. And I was so excited. And the kids would start using them. I would start using them. And eventually the tools would start disappearing. They would use ratchets as hammers and sockets through slingshots. And I tried to teach them to respect things, but it didn't always work that way. And I never had the tool that I needed when I needed a tool. So when my boys left home and uh, got their own tools and now at least one of them, their own kids to start losing their stuff, um, I told Joy I was gonna buy my own set of tools. Now I'm not, you know, like a Matco or a Snap-on kind of a guy, as you can tell. I'm a craftsman kind of guy. That's like, I wanted to buy something nice, but not crazy, you know, because I don't use them very often. So I ordered my tools and got my toolbox all situated. And, you know, I polished it all up and I was working on my motorcycle the other day and I needed a 10 millimeter socket. And do you know what? The 10 millimeter socket was never in my toolbox for 20 years. It was always gone because that's the first one that's always gone. And I walked out and I opened the drawer of my toolbox and I popped open my set of sockets and there was the number 10 millimeter socket right there where it needed to be, spotless in the right spot. I picked it up. I went over and removed the air box off my motorcycle, put the number 10 right back where it went, went inside and I said, Joy, I am so excited. I had the right tool. And not only was it the right tool, it was in the right place and I had a little party. Now, you might wonder what I'm talking about. James starts his letter to Jews who were going through various trials with the word that is not normally associated with trials or times of testing. And you may think, unthinkable. He says, consider it joy, my brothers and sisters, when you go through trials. Why? Because you have the right tool. Not because trials are fun, not because, because times of testing are things that we need to look forward to and to be superficial and Pollyanna, not just to throw and all things work together for good for those who love Jesus, because sometimes it's really hard to go through these things. But he says, take joy because you have the right tool, a joyful heart. And then he goes on and he says, whenever you face trials, and he says many kinds, which means multicolored, multicolored, various trials. Whenever means they're gonna come. 
not because you're a bad person, because we live in a fallen world and bad things happen to you and it's not always fair. Some things are worse than others that happen. And I don't know why some people go through things that are worse than the person next to them. God knows and he's just, but people go through terribly difficult things in life. James is painfully vague, which means he intended to be vague. When he said, we all go through heavy stuff, multicolored, multifaceted. It could be as petty as not having two socks that match and being in a bad mood. So you throw a temper tantrum or receiving a call from the doctor when he says you have cancer and your next few years are not gonna be anything like you thought they were gonna be. Anything and everything in between. And the problem is when some people with a faith that hasn't taken root hit the rock of a trial in their life, instead of taking joy and saying, thank you, God, I have you and your strength in my faith, which is the right tool. They shake their fist in God's face and say, why me? It's not fair. And they go the other way. And Jesus said, some are going to choose. And even the disciples who were listening were going to be faced with the same choice. So James, super relevant. He says, um, consider it joy when you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces patience. The word here is to be able to endure under the circumstances of life. Don't give up. He goes on, not just don't give up, but you know that the testing of your faith, it produces this patience, but let patience finish its work so that you may be, be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Press on. Don't look for other options. Don't allow the thoughts of doubt to creep into your head. Don't wonder whether this is real and God is paying attention. Don't listen to the voices of doubt and confusion because trials and testing happen to everyone. The righteous, the unrighteous, the just, the unjust. We all go through them, but they have the power to produce patience or perseverance or to crush your faith and send you off searching for answers that you'll never find in a world that's full of suggestions, but ultimately lacks hope. He says, don't give up. God is with you. The Holy Spirit within you. And so sometimes we ask the question, why is this happening to me, God? Why? Which is a fair question. And in my experience, God very rarely answers why. James goes on. And he said, if you lack wisdom, a view of life from God's perspective, ask him. And you know what? He'll give it generously without finding fault. And not only that, but when you get your answers, James goes on to say, grab onto him and don't let your mind waver. Sometimes we get stuck on the why. And we say, God, why me? And God sometimes doesn't answer the why, but the question he promises to answer as he produces this perseverance is how. You have the right tool. Let me show you how we walk through this. And on the other side of this comes something you could never get unless you go through this with me. How many of us have been tempted to walk away? How many of us have had conversations with God where sometimes we may shake the fist and ask if he's paying attention, wonder if he's really loving? That's natural. It's normal. It's human. Anybody who says they've never questioned God or, or wished maybe we could have done something different and said, if I was you, God, I wouldn't. We all do that. But James says, persevere. Don't get stuck there. Endure. 
the disciples, they went through trials with Jesus. They went through trials when Jesus ascended into heaven, so without Jesus. And at every opportunity or juncture, had to choose. Will I endure or will my faith crumble? Now, Jesus said saving faith endures. Now, it doesn't mean that you never have periods of doubt or question or concern or even rebellion. But it does mean that we always come back to our first and true love, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that if I'm willing to consider it joy because God gave me the right tool and not get preoccupied with what I think is fair or right and recognize that trials are going to come, to be willing to endure, to persevere, to pray and allow God to be my strength, to ask wisdom and understand that God's not really in the why business, he's in the how business and let him finish his work. Then on the other side, and if we jump down to the bottom here, when James tells us the payoff, he says to us, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood that test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the one who perseveres. Blessed is the one who doesn't crumble under the circumstances of life. Blessed is the one who doubles down when times get really difficult. Blessed is the one who has the courage to say the prayer. God, I have no idea why, and I have no idea how. I feel like I'm drowning, but I trust you. No other option, no other choice. I will endure. And then, then we understand this blessing that comes from God. Then we receive his strength. I want to show you how trials and tests can be good. Now, when I say good, I don't mean fun. When I say good, I don't mean something that we look forward to. When I say good, I mean something that's useful. And I want to develop very quickly just a little doctrine, a little theology, an understanding of what the Bible says about us going through difficult times. Because have I said, friends, you're gonna go through them. Are you going through them now? Is anybody going through a trial right now for yourself or for somebody else you love? Because sometimes those are the hardest. Anybody, I, I am, anybody else? Honest enough to raise your hands? Anyone going through some stuff? Anybody going through some stuff for somebody else, which by the way, is going through some stuff. Every external trial becomes internal. Eventually, we all go through stuff. I am going through stuff. Pastor Dan is going through stuff. We have to choose every day. Do I endure? And genuine, uncommon faith endures and receives a blessing at the end. We're all going through it because life's full of them. So what do we do? We realize that God can take even the bad things in this world and turn them into something useful. So if you say, Rick, how am I gonna get out of this trial? I'm gonna say, you know what? You probably can't, but you can get through it. And if you go through it with the Lord, you're gonna become useful. You're gonna become stronger. You're gonna know yourself because trials reveal the strength of our faith. And you're gonna know God. Let me show you some things from scripture as we close that I hope will encourage you. Number one, we see that times of testing are good because they reveal the source of our strength. I can be self-reliant, you can be self-reliant, we can be self-reliant. And when all of a sudden something happens that's bigger than we are, It reminds us the source of our strength. It reminds us of our need for God and removes the dependence that we have on all of this stuff. Remember when I asked you the question, what do you think about? What do you spend your time doing? What do you spend your money on? If and when something pops into your life that you would consider a trial or a time of testing, something big, the thoughts you're thinking right now are not thoughts that you are gonna think after this new circumstance or information enters into your life. 
when the worst happens. Something happens to a child, a job, a spouse, a relationship, your health, your finances, your future. The thoughts, the things that are important to you now are not important to you then. And it reminds us that we are weak. It reminds us that God is strong and it reminds us that the stuff that we put so much hope and stock in is not important. It restores our hope for heaven. It reveals who and what we really love according to Matthew 22. Reminds us of the blessings that God gives us that often come through a person. We become more useful according to 2 Corinthians. And then finally, God allows us to reach out to others. Now, I want you to look up these scriptures on your own. They're in your notes. And I want you to, to think about these things in your own time. But this last one's really important. And this is Jesus talking to Simon Peter in Luke chapter 21. He says, Simon, Satan has asked for permission to sift all of you as wheat. But I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail when you're going through the worst time of testing and trial. Why would Jesus pray for Simon Peter to endure in his faith during the darkest times in life? So that when your faith doesn't fail, you will be able to strengthen your brothers. Have you ever gone through a time in life that's unthinkable and somehow someone comes into your life who has been through a similar or same thing and relied on God's strength and been able to come up to you and put their arm around you and been able to say, I know how you feel. Now that's a deceptive statement because I don't know how you feel. You and I could have the same thing happen to us and you feel differently because you are you and I'm me. I've never been you going through it, but I've been me going through it. I know how I think you feel. And when this happened, I felt like I was drowning and did not know how to save myself. I panicked and I cried out. I thought about walking away. I wondered why God allowed these things to happen in my life. But by his grace, I didn't quit. And do you know what? He gave me his strength, the right tool. And even though it hurt and even though it took forever, we came through. And if you do the same thing, God's going to lead you through as well. And they put their arm around you and say, we'll walk through this together. Because even the perseverance and patience that God develops in you is not just for you. It's for the people who need you. Because people can see Jesus in you in the middle of their trial and storm because you're right there in their grill. And if you're honest, and I know you are because we're honest people, sometimes when we're in the middle of it, swinging blindly and hoping we hit something. It's hard to see the Lord. So, are you willing to consider it joy, not because you're going through something, but because you have the right tool? That when trials come, and they will, because you're breathing air and until you're not, they're gonna come. That when they come, that you will understand that God is going to use them for a purpose, that you'll endure and persevere without looking to any other option, that you won't ask God the why questions or ask him but then understand if he doesn't always answer because after all, some things are well above the pay grade. But when he gives us the how question, are you willing to take him by the hand and allow him to be your strength, to offer him our sense of fair, and allow him to be our Lord and our Savior. And then, when you've endured, are you willing to be that strength for somebody else? Because that's when you know you've healed. Some people just never heal. They just want to be wounded. 
It becomes the identity of the person. The worst event that ever happened. And sometimes it takes a long time to heal. And I'm not telling you there's a timeline for grief, for pain. I don't know what it is. But I know it seems like some people just never want to heal. And they allow themselves to be defined by the worst thing that ever happened to them and live in it. Never having allowed God to give them victory over it so that it was something that happened to them, but not something they became. Because that's God's finished work. When God finishes the work, he brings you through it and you never forget. And it always hurts, but when you're ready to be useful to him and to use your pain for his glory, that's the finished work of perseverance. So Jesus says in this parable, some people are going to have hearts where it looks like they receive the word with joy and the plant springs up and starts to produce all sorts of growth and you're so excited. But the second something bad happens, they shake their fist and walk away. That's not you and that's not me because uncommon faith endures. Father, thank you for my friends. And I pray that whatever they're going through today, and I know that there are people in here going through things, some honest enough to raise their hands just like I did and Pastor Dan, and many others in here probably going through some things, bearing burdens for other people, living with disappointment, with pain, with grief, with sorrow, with sadness, even some who on a holiday like this, Mother's Day, reminds them of pain, pain and loss of a, a child perhaps, or even a parent or a mother. And it's just hard to find that joy. I pray for my friends who are suffering, who are going through the trials, the tests of life. I pray, Father, that you would give them a supernatural joy, not that they are going through it, but that they have the right tool that they would reach out to you. And through your strength, the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would wrap them up with your arms of love and your arms of protection. You would guide them and direct them and keep them, bring them through the process of whatever it is that they are dealing with to completion. When perseverance has run its work, and Father, give us the gift of them being able to use their experience in our lives so that we can see your strength in them, even in times we don't think we can see you. I pray this for my friends because I love them, Father. But you love them far more than I do, and that's what counts. You believe in them, and you know how hard we're trying. We live in a world that sets itself up against this kind of faith. So we need your strength because we want to live this way because you are God. It's with that I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.